hope you all managed to get a little refreshment and a breath of fresh air, and thanks for coming back. Um, we've had some fascinating discussions, um, but I think what is going to be interesting about our, our next panel is a slight dose of reality. Um, and I think that's important because there's a lot that needs to be um, overcome in terms of the way the school system deals with dyslexic students. But um, our next panel is about game changes, about how we can shift and change expectations. And, um, and I think this, this video will explain a lot. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Capicella, the Chief Marketing Officer at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for more than 25 years, and one of the things I love most about the company is that we have a learning culture. Technology is a rapidly changing field, and it demands we operate with a growth mindset. It's our job to constantly learn from the world around us and look for new ways technology can empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. When our education team first started talking to Made by Dyslexia, it was clear that technology had an important role to play in helping not only change perceptions of dyslexia, but to empower people with dyslexia to reach their full potential. Visit any classroom in the world today, and in that classroom, one in five students has dyslexia. And there are likely far more who have not yet been identified because it's not screened for in most schools, and it can be a costly process for many families. As a result, students with dyslexia and their parents are often not aware of what's causing their challenges in the classroom. These children are often labeled as having a learning disability, making up approximately 70 to 85 percent of today's special education classes. And their teachers and parents don't often have the resources or the training to help, however passionate they may be. And without the proper support in formative years, a struggling student's confidence and love of learning can quickly fade, which has lasting effects throughout their lives. History has shown these great young minds can bring tremendous gifts to the world, like many of you in the audience tonight. That's why one year ago today, Microsoft became the very first company to sign the Made by Dyslexia Pledge to give the 700 million people around the world with dyslexia the access to technology that can empower them to excel in their academic journey and in their lives. Our team worked closely with Made by Dyslexia to develop intervention and training materials to help educators better support dyslexic students. We doubled down on our investments in tools like the Immersive Reader, which is free to all teachers and students and has proven to help those with dyslexia read and comprehend content more effectively. And today I'm delighted to announce we'll be supporting Made by Dyslexia's new campaign, Connecting the Dots, a global movement to level the playing field so every dyslexic child can achieve their potential. The world of work is rapidly changing, and there's a huge need for neurodiversity and creativity in the workplace. Research shows that dyslexic individuals have the skills we need, so there's an urgency for all of us to step up to help ensure these individuals can thrive in life and in the workplace. Connecting the Dots is leveraging the power of technology to galvanize and amplify the voices of brilliant educators, charities, grassroots organizations, and parents who work tirelessly to support dyslexia. One voice, one message, one mission to create global change, and Microsoft is thrilled to play a part in this movement. Thank you to everyone in the audience tonight for all that you do to support this important cause. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. This is Emily. Like one in 10 children, she will be born dyslexic. The left parietotemporal area of her brain will be affected, which means her neural pathways will be different from those born without dyslexia. Emily will see patterns most of us can't. She will grasp complex problems with ease and will think laterally differently, creatively. Because of her dyslexia, Emily could change the world with an invention or inspire a generation with her thinking, like Albert Einstein, John Lennon, Agatha Christie, or Richard Branson. These people made the world in which we live, and they were made 
by dyslexia. And for many of you who haven't been on the Made by Dyslexia website, particularly all of you at home, please go on. It's fascinating. There are a lot of good videos and a lot of interactive um, aspects where you can actually test yourself, um, even if you think, hmm, maybe I am. It, it's a good place to find some clarity. Um, so we're talking about game changers and education. Um, when I told somebody that I, I knew, an acquaintance, that I was dyslexic, she looked at me in horror, and I've told this story before. Um, she looked at me in horror and she went, but you don't look dyslexic. Um, <laughs> And I, I don't know what she thought a dyslexic should look like, third eye, extra leg, I don't know. But either way, it's that kind of response by a mother of four children to what she saw as a, as a disability. Now, many of us here are trying to stop the idea that, you know, this is not a disability. This is something that is something to be celebrated. But in schools uh, in the US, across the world, often the dys dyslexic child has to be tested and called, called a, dis a disability. Um, and that then gives the gateways to some sort of help and remediation. So there's this sort of dichotomy on how to label yourself, but at the same time, how to get help. And I think that's where we're going to sort of plow through a lot of this detail with our next panel. So please, let me introduce Her Royal Highness, Princess Beatrice. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, Kate Griggs, who's the CEO of Made by Dyslexia. Gavin Horgan, the headmaster of Millfield School. Charlie Miller, who's co-founder of Flip, Flip Group. And uh, Flip Grid, there we are. You just heard what I did. Um, and um, also, which has obviously just been brought up by Microsoft. And Martina Milburn, who's the CEO of the Princess Trust and chair of, social, of the Social Mobility Commission. Welcome to you all. None of you look dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There we go. Um, I want to. We're talking about education, so let's go to the headmaster. How uh, how are schools providing support for dyslexic children? Where are the gaps? Um, huge question. Thank mm. you. Uh, and. One thing that I wanted to address, maybe there was a bit of a light motif in the first half, which almost sounded like. Uh, schools were the problem uh, and, and I'm not convinced that that's the case uh, and I think uh, across the world I've visited and worked in schools all over the world um, there's one thing that unites educators in pretty much every school in the world uh, they want the best for the children in their school and, and I've been convinced by that in in pretty much every school I've, I've ever been into um, However, we do have a system that currently restricts schools, and it's essentially our examination system. Uh, examinations probably are being used as a system to measure schools rather than to measure children, and so that's the first big failing uh, in those. Um, Also, we've got a, we've got a, I think I said in something that was on earlier, we've got a crisis, and the crisis is this crossing point, which is we've got an anachronistic examination system that is testing things like your capacity to hold on to facts, uh, your capacity to manage spelling, punctuation, and grammar accurately, and that is in itself restricting, uh, it is essentially disenfranchising dyslexic people who are neurally diverse and they have the skills that we need in the workplace of the future. Uh, so we've got to essentially rethink from the start. We've got to get rid of an examination system which restricts uh, dyslexic learners. We've got to allow them to flourish and we've got to provide the training and the resources for teachers to be able to support them in school. Okay, so we know what to do. Let's talk about your experience, Princess Beatrice, going through school, being dyslexic, and, and the challenges and the way you've found a way around it. I think, you know, being, dys being dyslexic for me, being diagnosed quite young, it was such a sense of relief mm -hmm. as well. I remember what those words, you know, looking around the page, you're seeing your, your daughter spelling things backwards. I still can't tell the difference between certain and curtain. 
a bit awkward. Um, <laughs> but you know, those 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 little those little things um, that when you're very young, when you're trying to find your voice in the world, um, they can be a big stumbling block. Um, but I think as we go through, as we grow up, and as we look to some of these great companies that were on the stage earlier, I think that there are other ways to define yourselves. I think, especially if you're being, especially as a dyslexic um, person who has probably in grown up in a very unusual fashion, but also trying to find my own voice in the world, now working for an, in artificial intelligence and data analytics, I think that it is, we have, we have the time now where we should be look, focusing on the skill side of things. And I think that school, school for me was always the harder, more, you know, more on the challenging side, but at the same time, I love nothing more than the school environment. Um, I think I, you know, I, I love what school stands for. I love the sense of community. I love the diversity. I love the friendships that are forged at school. And I don't think we should ever lose heart of that, part of that. But I think that there are, as you rightly said, there are other ways with which we can measure ourselves. You know, school gives us so much, and I really don't want to take away from that. But I think also um, there are so many ways that we could think through this. I think one of the reasons why we're even having this conversation and we've got this such an esteemed group of people now is because we do have to look at things differently if we're going to combat some of the challenges that every young person is facing for the 21st century. So, you know, the time is now, um, and I just feel very lucky that um, if I had an opportunity to, to meet my 16-year-old self struggling with A-levels, to say, you know, don't worry, just hang on in there. Yeah, you'll be okay. Yeah, it'll be, yeah. It'll be okay. Um, Kate, you're the force of nature behind this conference, behind Made by Dyslexia. And you've often said to me, we know how, what to do. Uh, what, what needs to be done? And do you think this shifting of a paradigm that's cancelling exams or not putting so much focus on punctuation and spelling, do you think that is happening? And can it happen? So I think there are two things. Um, I think, firstly, we need to look at levelling the playing field. And the problem we have at the moment is that um, most teachers aren't trained. So most dyslexic children aren't being identified. They're not being given the support that they need and they're not being taught in the way that they need to learn. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then they're just not going to flourish at school. So we have to find a way of making sure that all dyslexic kids are identified and all teachers are trained. And we're working very hard with Microsoft right now on the teacher training part of it. Um, and then I think we have to make sure that we look at how, specifically how we test or we put dyslexic children through exams. I mean, to, to actually test a dyslexic child and grade them on their spelling, punctuation and grammar is quite honestly cruel. I mean, we just are not good at that. And it shouldn't. Anybody listening from government, this government particularly, because we have all these exam changed, has to listen to that message because it is not right and it should not be happening. Equally, expecting a dyslexic child to remember everything and then put that down writing by hand on one day in an exam is absolutely ridiculous. And I think you've heard this evening from all of the people on, on all of the panels how that is not the real world. So we need to firstly level the playing field so we're not putting kids, our dyslexic kids through that, make sure we're identifying them. But then we actually need to look at the exam system across the board for everybody because the world needs dyslexic thinking and we know that that's not going to be brought out through our education system. So not just for dyslexics, but actually for the world. This is a really, really important message. Our education systems around the world are broken, but in the UK they are so broken we have to change them urgently. Yeah, because it's, it's safe to say, but it's actually a, a fact, that every teacher will have a dyslexic kid or more in her or his classroom, just statistically. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, in the UK, we say it's one in ten. Um, in America, they say it's one in five. When, when we were doing our research um, for the Rose Review, we were screening all children in schools, and it was coming out at one in five. So it is a lot more than than um, we're identifying already. So it, 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 it counts, it matters to absolutely everybody. And also what's good for dyslexic children is actually good for all children. So it's a win-win situation. Um, you mentioned uh, technology. Tell us about how you've in many ways contributed to helping dyslexic kids in the classroom. A little bit unbeknownst to you wasn't your initial. Unbeknownst. Um, I have to agree completely with Kate. I think when, 
especially in the context of technology, and I know there's a lot of amazing teachers sitting in this audience right now. Um, when we build an inclusive classroom for all learners, all learners, everyone wins. Just everyone wins. And technology can play a big role in that. I started a little platform called Flipgrid. Um, I just had a lot of PhD students. I had 12, actually. And I wanted to hear their thoughts on design. I wanted to hear what challenged them, what they were inspired about, what they were excited about. I wanted to see their energy about design. And the platform is very simple. I, ask, I pose a question as the educator. They record a short video as the student. And what I found out is... Um, over the years, as it's grown, it's grown quite a bit bigger than those 12, um, it's students with uh, speech apraxia, uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, um, student um, selective mutism. And we've heard these stories. It used to be once a month, and then it used to be once a week, and now it's once a day, of an educator reaching out to us and saying, I have this student, and through Flipgrid I saw this impact, and, and she couldn't be more wrong. It has nothing to do with Flipgrid. It has to do with an amazing educator finding a new modality for a student to shine and, and bring out those great aspects and strengths that they have. And I absolutely love it. And it's, it's been, honestly, the, the greatest privilege of my life. Yeah, and I want to talk broadly also about what Microsoft is doing um, as well. But, Martina, to you, th this is, as I think one of our earlier panelists said, in many ways, we're celebrating people who made it in spite of their weaknesses. Um, and I often say, not to sort of misquote Spider-Man's uncle, um, you know, that my greatest weakness is my greatest strength. Um, but many children are, are not, you know, not actually getting there. And this is a brick wall. And the concept of social mobility and disadvantaged children really plays into this. Give us some perspective from your, from your point of view. Well, last week I met a mother who is a single parent living in social housing, very ambitious for herself and her children. She has three children. Her youngest son is seven. And she was particularly distraught when she spoke to me last week because he's just been put on restricted hours at school. So because of his behaviour in the classroom, he's not able to do a full day in school. And I said, what, what did the school say? What did the teacher say? And she was so distraught, she said, he's dyslexic. They've diagnosed him. What am I going to do? They have said he could go to a special school or he can be home tutored. She has no resources, she has no money to support him, other than her sort of personal pride in her children. Now, on the other side of the coin, and I do agree, I am quite sure for those teachers in a class with over 30 pupils and in a not great part of the country, his behaviour was disruptive and was difficult. The point is, for both the mother that child and the school, at this point in time, there is nowhere for that child to go. I couldn't even offer her the Prince's Trust because we start at 11. Mm -hmm. And I say, think we pick up a lot of young people through the Prince's Trust mm -hmm. who deem themselves as failures, think they've failed at everything, but mostly the only thing they need is some support and self-belief. So... I am hugely, hugely proud of the fact that Kate and Made by Dyslexia have become social mobility ambassadors. It is really important, and we as a commission cannot do this by ourselves. We need everybody calling for change, supporting this campaign, and as Kate said, we need a complete sea change across the education system. Until that happens, as we know, technology is helping fill in some of those weaknesses just break down, even for a kid who doesn't have much, that has a warrior mom, what can, what can they do by interfacing with Microsoft that can at least perhaps ease their situation right now? What, where can you point them? Yeah, I think there's, there's three key areas, and I, and I actually don't say this as being a part of Microsoft now. I say this as being a parent and also being a professor of ed technology for a decade before joining Microsoft. The Immersive Reader, as Chris talked about, it's a very simple platform. You can open up any text in Office, in Edge, in Minecraft, in Flipgrid. And what it'll do is it'll highlight the lines, it'll break apart the syllables, it will um, identify the words of speech, it'll bring in a picture dictionary, it'll, trans or it'll narrate the text for you. You can translate that into 40 languages. And 
I know a lot of people use the words one of, but it is the most important ed technology platform ever, just ever, because it levels the playing field and empowers every single learner to be able to access that. And what we found out is even the families, um, when, when, the, when the homework might come home or even the questions that the students were asked to, to work on might come home, families that might um, be dyslexic, they might speak English as a second language, they just might be um, not very adept in reading, they also can leverage it to have that conversation with their child. And I think that's one of the easy ways. Um, we've also partnered with Made by Dyslexia to make an amazing course for the Microsoft educator community that is free for any educator, any family member, any um, headmaster of one of the coolest schools I've ever heard of. <laughs> um, it's free for anybody. Yeah. Um, but it, it's all it's doing is working with Made by Dyslexia to really just highlight the strengths that are there and the opportunities to work with it. And I think that level of awareness is step one. When you talk about awareness, uh, Princess Beatrice, how is this an exercise in rebranding? Someone like you comes out and how important is that? Or, or do we need to move past that? I think there are two ways of looking at this. Firstly, on one side, yes, it's about rebranding. I think, I think that and you need to focus on that for the child, for the parent, but also for the teacher as well. So I think it's about generating that understanding of you know, that video that you've produced is sort of what it is to be an innovator. And I think um, you know, what it is for parents when they have to go through that assessment process, there is actually nothing wrong with your child, not the way that you look, not the way that you sound, not the way that you read. I think that's a very, very, very important thing that we have to do. I think everyone in this room who's got a very personal story to tell, um, no matter whether you're dyslexic or not, I think that makes it incredibly inclusive. But I think the other side of this is also you know, rebranding the classroom as well mm -hmm. and actually um, giving young people a chance to think about the classroom as a place to thrive um, and that no matter what kind of skills you're looking at, especially in the UK, we've got a lot of young people um, you know, English as a second language, who could so benefit from the skills that are taught by teachers. But then something else that I really um, am very passionate about in terms of branding is what it is to be a teacher nowadays is something that is so vitally important to make sure that those young people have the right um, for the right places to go to, the right places in the world. I think, you know, teaching, uh, the teaching profession is our first line of defense. And if we do not give teachers the tools to be able to care for themselves, their mental health, but also that of the child, then I think we're also doing a disservice. So I am so lucky to be working with Made by Dyslexia to really champion the way that we should be looking after our teachers to make sure that they have the um, skills as well. Yeah, you make an excellent point. Um, I, I know, and I've spoken about my daughter a lot, but she just had the perfect pathway. She was red flags, she was at a private school, red flags, diagnosed, went, uh, got accepted into the Skank School in Atlanta, um, did two years, she's just gone into mainstream school. And one of my family members said after her two years there, is she fixed now? <laughs> um, and in many ways, that's also a, a good question because what you do is, is the perfect way to teach dyslexic children, but as Kate says, any children. So just give us a sense of what you do and how hopefully you could create, create it in, in, a, in a bigger scale. Yeah, I think if anyone could take away one thing from this evening, it's that. It's what is good for dyslexic people generally is good for everyone else. Um, so uh, the, the, the business of the teacher who stands at the front of the room and forces the child to copy reams of text off the board, what are they actually learning at that point? Probably very little. Um, whereas the teacher who employs a variety of different techniques, most of them communicating, most of them inviting the pupils up to influence others, to lead others, mm -hmm. those are playing to dyslexic strengths but they're playing to the strengths of all learners. They're helping all learners to, to thrive and to flourish. I do want to add a little bit to Martina's point earlier, which is that in the UK, and I'm sure the same is true elsewhere as well, last year we branded one third of children age 16 as failures uh, because they failed to achieve an adequate pass in their English examination. Uh, and, that, and a significant proportion of those will have been dyslexic learners. And it's because we are 
constantly emphasizing what people can't do rather than thinking about what they can do. And surely that's what we're looking for from CVs in the workplace, is that diversity, that emphasis of my strengths. Uh, and, and therefore, that's what schools need to do as well, which is to give children an opportunity, as Millfield has always done since the 30s. Uh, the, the organization needs to adapt around the individual rather than forcing the child to fit to the needs of the organization. Absolutely, and um, you guys do, do some really amazing work. Kate, Kate to you, and I think um, dyslexia is hereditary. I mean, if and, and that's how I picked up that I was dyslexic because my child was flagged as dyslexic, and then they said to me, oh, you know, it's genetic, and suddenly you have this penny dropping, and you're like, holy moly, that's exactly why I struggled at school. That's exactly why I can do this and not do that. Um, how do you, how do you in, in, in educating adults, how do you then backtrack into how they perhaps start their kids in early schooling with this sort of self-knowledge? Is that part of what you're trying to do as well? I think so, yes. Self-diagnosis is what I'm saying, you yeah. know, which you can do on your website. Yeah, you can. I mean, my, my entire family are dyslexic and we were very lucky because we were sent to a really supportive school and, and it's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing because my elder son had real problems in school and I couldn't believe that teachers still weren't trained. We were lucky we could pay for an education to support him. Um, but actually the reality is that most dyslexic people don't know that they're dyslexic. Yeah. So I think finding out that you are dyslexic is a really important thing for anybody. Um, I think that if you have a, a child that's struggling at school and you struggled at school, there's definitely a bit of a, a, a sort of stigma attached to and worry that, oh, my God, I, I struggled. Is my child going to be struggling too? And I think that's part of what we're trying to do with the whole changing people's perception of dyslexia is to, to help people to want to find out and to embrace it because the school system has never fitted dyslexic children, to be honest, so it won't fit dyslexic adults and most dyslexics go on to or hopefully go on to, to achieve good things in life but yes it is about everybody trying to find out and and trying to make sure the education system is screening all kids and everybody does discover so Martina if that's the case if if you know your child is dyslexic or you suspect he or she is um, how important is it for parents to sort of drive and again this connecting the dots theme for parents to drive and pressure schools to say, hey, you need to give my kid an extra few minutes on tests. Can he, can he or she rather listen to an audiobook of Harry Potter than having to try and plough through Harry Potter, but still then present the book report with a, you know, with a video cam instead of having to write it out? How, how much space is there for kids and parents who you speak to to do that? Go to the local library and just push from, push from, from, from below. I think it completely depends on the area you live in and the type of school you attend. So with my sons who are dyslexic, um, and I was diagnosed age 60, so there we go, there we go. <laughs> um, it was easy. The teachers were very sympathetic. They had extra time in their exams. We were sorting it out. Firstly, we do not have young people in this country who all have adequate parents. So what do you do with them? What do you do with young people coming out of the care system? It's got to be more than just hoping you've got a warrior parent or a teacher who really cares enough to push you. We've got to look at changing the system. And one of the things everybody in this room can do is start asking your local councillors, your local MPs, what actually are they looking at doing around things like dyslexia, around things like social mobility? We can make a change, but at the moment, we're struggling to really get these things to, to capture the imagination of the country in the way, say, climate change has done. So we can do that. You can ask people and our elected politicians, what are you prepared to do about it? You can look at the state of your local further education college, because at the moment, we take young people who haven't got the right grades in English and maths, and we get them to do retakes, mostly, at their local further education college. 90% of further education colleges started this term with not enough teachers. You are paid more at a, as a secondary school teacher now than you are as an FE teacher. 
So we take the kids who have already been told they're failing, we put them into these colleges who are really trying hard and do have some fantastic staff, but have had cut after cut after cut, much more than schools actually. And then we discover that the bulk of them on their retakes fail. And then we say, why don't you try a third time? And even more people fail. And we wonder why we're getting the results we're getting. So, you know, it's back to Einstein, isn't it? Yeah. If you're going to do things the same, you're going to get the same results. So it's time. Let's leave this room and really start fighting because those kids are worth it. And using the tools that are available and exactly. trying to democratise that. And, and I, I mean, is and I, and I asked Princess Beatrice about this, is this also about a branding exercise? You, you've got it. You can offer it. It's free. It's, it's, it's out there for teachers, for educators. How do you, how do you push it? I think you push it through the community. I mean, I think a community builds community. A company does not build community. And I think what we really try to do in that is any educator that, that reaches out or is using Flipgrid or really any platform, Microsoft, Flipgrid, or otherwise, um, we just try to engage with them and we try to tell them the four words that they should hear every day. Thank you and great idea. We tell them thank you for using it. Great idea. We love how you're using it. After that, we try to amplify their stories. Uh, community is truly built where our stories intersect. And when we amplify their stories and the impacts, they love it. And ultimately, then they feel empowered to continue building that community. And that creates this great flywheel effect that um, there's nothing better in the world than championing teachers, especially ones that are creating impacts for kids of, of just all ages. Yeah, and saying great job is, you know, is, is, is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. um, Princess Beatrice, you work across a number of charities. Um, education yeah. is a passion for you. Is there something that you can see is, a, is an easy fix? Great question. OK. Um, no, I don't think there is necessarily an easy fix. I think it takes great collaboration. Um, I think it takes, I think it takes a lo think locally to act globally. I look at some of the examples exactly as you're describing. Um, look to talk to your local councils, because I think people are desperately trying. They want to be able to connect the dots mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the easy, the, easy, the easy things that we could do um, is, having the, is starting the conversation. You know, turning up, being open about the fact that you are dyslexic. Um, I think that that is a great way to start. And I think, you know, the more people we get onto this journey, um, the more long-term system change we will be able to create. But a little bit like the debate we're having around climate change now, the, um, the great education debate as to what skills we really do need to provide to the classroom for the 21st century and how we can be inclusive with our classrooms. Um, I think that we, you know, this needs to be um, brought brought to a head and uh, I'm just so lucky to be partnering with these incredible organizations that we you see here to be able to champion that so we can start connecting the dots. You, thank you, that, and you, you work with these young minds every day and you have. Um, is there a, a quick fix that you can suggest is an easy way to democratize? Oh, I, I think there probably is, isn't there? Which is to listen to the children's voices. Um, it's really straightforward. Uh, they probably know what works for them. Uh, they if they love bogs, they, they, no, yeah, they exactly. Uh, they know what works for them. Uh, they know how to work around things. Uh, they're much quicker with the TV remote control than <laughs> I am. Um, so, so listen to their voice and start to level the playing field. Uh, the EY report said it perfectly. Uh, it said share best practice, which we can all do within this room, within the world. It said uh, automate as quickly as possible and as much as possible, level the playing field, and it said create a culture of expectation around neurodiversity. So I think we could all do that. Uh, it might take longer to achieve it. I want to add one thing, mm. sorry. Teacher training. That could be a very good quick fix. Um, yeah, agreed. Um, Martina, as you listen to all of this, and you listen particularly to our last panel of, of very successful people who felt that they, in their own companies, were championing, or at least trying to. How frustrating is it for you seeing some kids who, who know that they won't make the cut um, because of just the lack of opportunity they've had or the lack of realisation that they're dyslexic? The reality compared to perhaps the sort of success stories that we've heard. Well, I know there's some Prince's Trust young people in the audience. Actually, on the whole, if they're able to have the right support 
they can absolutely achieve stuff. So the frustration comes where you see that they haven't had support in their journey. And it just depends how much life has already kind of um, damaged people, I suppose, if that's the right word. But we have great companies in this country, and most of the ones on the last panel work with us. Yeah. And they are prepared to take our young people. HSBC have been fantastic. We've had a large number of Prince's Trust young people who now work in HSBC, for example, who certainly didn't come with the right degrees or the right qualifications. So where people are prepared to help, it's great. The one thing I would say is it's not enough just to open the door. You have to put the right support around that person. So with mentorship, um, with just listening, actually, and being understanding. And if you can do that, you can achieve great things. Um, Kate, to you, and I know we've spoken about this before, this is all about championing the positives of dyslexia, sort of saying, well, the weaknesses are here, we'll put them over here and let's focus on the strengths. But if you, I know at least in, in the US, if you want remedial help for your children, and I was sort of trying to get to that when I introduced you, you have to have your child diagnosed as having a disability, literally, before you can, the schools can open up some remediation. What do you make of that? So, I think all children should be screened really early and intervention should be put in at that point. You shouldn't have to have a diagnosis um, and, and that just isn't ever going to happen for you know, hundreds of pounds or thousands of dollars to have a child assessed. Yeah. Um, part of the reason that, as Made by Dyslexia, we're focusing on the positives is to get the world to understand the value of dyslexia and the value of dyslexic thinking in the world we live in today. Because we've known how to identify and how to support dyslexia since the 1930s when Millfield was set up. And we still are not doing it right in schools. So we have to, we have to look at why now is a really important time to do it. We need to leverage technology to be training every single teacher should have an awareness in dyslexia. And the course that we've produced with Microsoft has been viewed by 170,000 people now. Um, every teacher, every educator, every politician, everybody in the education department should look at at least an hour's worth of awareness training to understand why it's so important that we address this now. It shouldn't be a, a case that you've got to go through the rigmarole of being labelled disabled before you get the support that you need. And in fact, some research that we just did into um, dyslexia in schools found that in America, 70% of schools in America won't use the term dyslexia which is ridiculous because as dyslexic people and you know we're all made by dyslexia that's the empowering thing so we have to start wanting to find it instead of hiding it um, and that starts with with skilling up everybody parents and teachers so they're not frightened of it and they want to deal with it and they want to, to see it yeah you may make an excellent point um, I do want to wrap up I think we could talk for a lot longer but again with all of you if you don't mind giving me and I think something practical or something that you think can create some momentum as we start, as we have this conversation? Um, Princess Beatrice, just to, to summarise. Um, great. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, that's just, and I think, you know, this wonderful panel, there's been so much to think about. Um, I think what I, what I take away from all of this um, is that we really need to start sort of as you said, screening and diagnosing a lot sooner. Um, but I also think we really need to create a, a safe place to have this conversation. Um, and I think that you know summits like this are a very, very good place to start. Um, I look to a future where um, instead of asking what's wrong, you know, why a dyslexic won't fit into that bucket, we have to ask why is the bucket not ready for that person to fit into it. So I'm excited to explore that a bit more. Okay, Kate. Uh, I think we need to let teachers do what they want to do, which is teach kids and not make children pass exams. Uh, and I think we need to get the entire education system to understand the value of dyslexia and the strengths that dyslexia can bring. Because clearly, from everything you've heard from the workforce today, that's what employers want. Martina? I think all of us need to do our bit and stop thinking the problems with somebody else and really challenge people, especially at election times, to do things differently. 
and that's why Made by Dyslexia's mm -hmm. pressure is continuing. I Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, Gavin. Uh, schools should be safe places where uh, crucibles of discovery, uh, where children feel safe and where their passions are unlocked for life. Uh, in order to achieve that, uh, we need employers that emphasise neurodiversity uh, in their recruitment practices and we need to scrap an examination system which uh, prejudices against dyslexics. I think we need to empower every dyslexic child, or just every child for that matter, to be proud and confident of their unique strengths. Where's Lucy? I can't really see much. Where's Lucy? Lucy's somewhere in here. Just give a woo. Right up there. So Lucy was so excited to come um, and just explain that she's going to go into product design. I can't wait to use what you build. Um, and she was just proud and confident in the fact of going into that field. And I think that as educators is what we all need to do, uh, is, is to empower people like Lucy to be really excited and proud of those unique strengths. Brilliant. Thank you to you all. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. But I know that we've also got a few other people who are going to ask some questions. In particular, Martina, you, you've worked with these children. I don't know where you are. <laughs> I'm looking for the Princess Trust wave. There we go. Oh, right here. Ah. Um, I do want to give the perspective of students, and I would love for you to ask this illustrious panel um, some, some very probing questions. <laughs> yeah, so my question really is... And uh, introduce yourself. Oh, so my name is Harry. Um, I went on the Princess Trust Enterprise Program, and I too was branded a complete failure by the education system. And you changed my life, so thank you. Um, but my business now runs... Uh, programs in the Caribbean, changing young people's lives. And I believe that extraordinary things can happen when you back young people who have the audacity to be different. And I don't know what the world's going to look like in five years. None of you do, no matter how knowledgeable you are. So how can we educate our young people for the world that they're going to live in? For me, if we can send young people out of the education system with the resilience, the adaptability and the confidence to be themselves, they can achieve anything. But how in practice do we actually educate that? Do we need to take people out the classroom? Do we need to, to reduce greatly the amount of exams that young people take? How does it actually work? Who would like to answer that? Thank you, Harry. Shall I start? Go for it. Yeah, and then give everyone else some, some thinking time. Um, <laughs> I, I think you've, you've alluded to the answer, actually, in the question. Um, we need to have education systems that are values-based, uh, and schools need to think about what their core purpose is, and then they need to go hell for leather uh, after the core purpose. Um, and for too long, uh, the core purpose has been achieving good exam results so that the school is better regarded by whoever it is that inspects them. Uh, and, and that has taken the child away from the core purpose. Um, I do think that uh, we have an issue around resilience and teaching children uh, how to fail and to learn from failure. And we were speaking about this earlier. Um, in this country and in other countries, we are dismantling brick by brick the things that are most important to teach that resilience. So if we take away sport, that's often where that resilience was taught. If we take away art, if we take away music, if we take away drama, that is often where those core skills are taught. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing. You're getting a lot of nods. <laughs> there we go. Anybody want to chip in? No, I just completely agree, <laughs> yeah. totally. It's, I think it's about, again, it's to the point of finding your strengths. I mean, if you find what you're good at and you love to do, then you're going to succeed. That should happen in school. I like the idea of it also a, you know, a collaborative classroom as well. Like, that, you know, as you said earlier, it's listening to the students. You know, it's, it's, it's their way as well as the kind of teacher leading the class as well. I think that's the sense of collaboration. But I've also seen some really successful models of collaborations with different subjects as well, so how drama and history are taught together. And yeah. So kind of you know, taking things and making them in a new way. Joining the dots Joining as the well. Dots. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you, Harry. I think Sarah is, is there and wants to also ask a question. Hello, um, my name is Najla. I'm a young ambassador for the Trust. And um, I work in the railway um, with the help of the Trust. Um, 
I found it quite really hard when I finished my university education, tried to get into um, finding work to get into the real kind of uh, job market. That's when I got uh, in touch with the trust to get a little bit of extra help in that. Um, I found it really um, daunting kind of recruitment process, long recruitment process, um, exempt kind of exams to do online and um, every exam I'll be timed out before I finish even the exam, <laughs> finish the questions. And um, if we change, if we try to change kind of one thing in recruitment process, it, um, to be able to help more dyslexic um, people to, to get into um, employment, um, what will it be um, to give equal opportunity, um, not necessarily to only dyslexic, but also to uh, to to, di to diverse um, ne neuro uh, applicant? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. It's great to have your perspective. Um, again, I'm going to throw it to the panel and who would like to answer? Well, you are right. There is an issue with HR departments. And um, some years ago, um, a chap called Mark Bolland, who was um, CEO at Marks and Spencers, and myself started something called Movement to Work, which was about getting kids who were long-term unemployed into some of our major businesses. It started through the recession. And the biggest challenge we had, without doubt, was through the HR departments. So while we're changing the world, along with looking at teacher training, I would really look at how the HR departments do stuff. And often, even when the CEO is saying, I really want this to happen, mm. especially you try being a young person with some kind of offending background, computer says no very quickly. <laughs> and um, I think... It's all part of what I meant by each one of us looking at what we personally can do differently within all our fields. Thank you. Um, brilliant question. Um, will we going to have another question? I'm not sure from, from Lucy or are we going to move on? I think that's... Um, I don't think you have a microphone, Lucy. No. OK. So I wasn't sure on that one. Um, I'm really, really grateful to this panel because it's also a dose of hard reality. Um, and that's important because there's still a lot, a lot to do as you've all lined up. But thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Kate to stay behind um, because she's going to explain connecting the dots and she's going to connect the connecting of the dots. <laughs> um, Princess Beatrice, good luck. I know you're doing some great work. Thank you very much. Martina as well. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, and to you, Gavin, and to Charlie, all of you in your own way, making such a huge difference, providing tools which everybody out there can utilise. So thank you. All. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, um, Kate, as I said, the, one of the new focuses is, is connecting the dots. And Kate has a real-life experience and, and, and description of how this has happened. Um, and I wouldn't mind you just sort of explaining how connecting the dots works and how everybody here can sort of do six degrees of separation and make some real change. Great. So, hopefully this evening you'll have um, realised that Dyslexic thinking is a brilliant way of thinking and it has a huge value to the world. Um, we're hearing that from lots of employers. We're hearing that from the EY report. We're also hearing that we know exactly what dyslexic children need. It's early identification, focusing on their strengths and having the support through school. We've also heard that we've known since the 1930s how that should be happening. Technology is here. Technology can enable dyslexic children. You've heard from the EY report this evening that the things that we find challenging are now being taken over by technology, so we actually don't really need to worry so much about those. And the things that dyslexics are good at are the skills that we need for the future. So how do we connect all of this up? If we know what's happening, we know it's not happening in our schools, and we know we need these minds, how is that going to work? Well, as Martina tapped into today, it very much is about giving everybody the opportunity to campaign for change. So Connecting the Dots is the new campaign that we're launching in the new year, and it's asking everybody, every parent, every educator, 
to get involved and to push for the change that we need. So we'll have a really structured campaign for you. We'll give you tools for you to advocate with, to take into your letters to write to your, or emails to write to your politicians, take into your schools. And we're also going to be providing more teacher training resources for you to help to get everybody to do. It's about bringing together all of the brilliant charities out there that are doing fantastic work, all of the parents that are campaigning for their kids, all of the brilliant organisations who are trying to push dyslexia forward. We recently had um, a situation where connecting the dots worked perfectly. Well, we were invited over to Gibraltar um, by the Gibraltar Dyslexia Association to uh, give a talk. And they brought together lots of influential people from business and from education in Gibraltar. Um, ben from EY came over with me. We both gave a talk. And after the talk, we were invited in to see the Prime Minister of, or the Chief Minister of Gibraltar, who saw what we were saying. Uh, his staff were in the audience. We sat with him and explained why dyslexia is so important. And we'll just play you a message now of, of what's happened since uh, we did that talk. I'm delighted that Gibraltar has been the first nation to sign up to the Made by Dyslexia pledge. I'm very happy that we're going to do more with the Gibraltar Dyslexia Support Group to ensure that we support those with dyslexia in our schools and generally in our nation and in our economy. In the new world of work, machines are taking over a lot of the manual activities that we used to do. We need people who think differently and dyslexics sometimes bring those skills to the equation. We're going to work with Made by Dyslexia and the Gibraltar Dyslexia Support Group to ensure that we take those skills where we have them and we put them to work in the Gibraltar economy and in our job market. If Gibraltar could sign up to the Made by Dyslexia pledge, I throw down the gauntlet to every other nation in the world to follow suit and to also sign up to the pledge. So there you go. There we go. Gauntlet thrown. Gauntlet thrown. Um, just before we finish, I just would like to say a huge thank you to Innovision. Um, Claudia is one of our trustees and has done an amazing job and her team putting on this evening. And also to our other trustees, Mervyn and Roland, and all of the speakers and everybody who's come here this evening. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And, and I know from many of us, the drive to make a lot of this change, this momentum is being pushed by you. And um, I think a lot of us want to thank you as well for, for, for everything that you're doing and for never letting up. So if I, if I could ask one thing of you all, it would be to follow us on social media, help us fundraise, which is really important. There's a booklet on our website now called Connecting the Dots, and that's going to give you a start to what you can do. But keep an eye out for what we're doing in the new year, and please just join us, and let's change things for good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and that's our evening. Um, really appreciate you all being here at the Science Museum. It's a fantastic facility. We are now going to move on and have some networking and a, um, a drink. A, a drink. Um, and, um, yeah, talk, listen, that's, connect. that's connect. There we go. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank really you. appreciate you listening.